Welcome to Rural Investment Media. I'm Albert Liu here alongside Rick Rule for the Rural Classroom. Rick, how are you? I'm great, Albert. Thank you for hosting this. Thank you for joining me again. Uh, we have a new topic this week, and that is the topic of developers. Rick, why don't you give us uh, the introduction and the customary definition uh, of the class of companies that we're looking at today? Let's start with a definition. I define uh, developers as companies that are the, that are the owners of mineral properties where the ultimate development of the property is a probability as opposed to a possibility, which is to say a company that has either acquired or discovered a property that has enough documentation and enough documented uh, evidence of uh, economic feasibility <clears throat> that you think that there is a much more than reasonable chance that the property will be turned in, turned into a mine. That the process that the company is really in the process of de of developing rather than discovering uh, an economic deposit. And there are lots of things uh, to consider here, and we'll try to talk about all of them. We'll try to talk about the important metrics to understand uh, in the documentation around the probability uh, of production. We'll talk about the various levels of certainty because really you increase the economic value of a deposit by reducing uncertainty uh, around its development. We'll talk about that process. We'll talk about the necessary uh, understanding of capital structures, how much debt, what kind, how much equity, what forms of hybrid debt and equity are most efficacious. And we'll talk about, too, uh, the art, because it's not a science, <laughs> of reading news releases to develop, to understand the construction process on time, on budget. Very often, the risks that companies run are reported publicly, but the investors either don't know or don't care about how to avoid those risks by reading publicly available documentation. We'll talk too about the need for specific expertise in the development process. And we'll talk to channel an earlier conversation uh, about the difference between pre-tax and post-tax returns and political risks uh, and the unspoken uh, expenses of government royalty and taxation. So we've got a lot to cover today, Albert. Yeah, I su well, I suspect this is gonna be a multi-episode topic, which is just fine. Uh, before we get started, Rick, this is a distinct class of companies for sure, but how often is the developer also uh, the group that discovered uh, the deposit? How often does that happen? Well, it's very worth noting. There, there are two things. I'm not gonna answer your question directly, but uh, developers are often hybrid. There are often companies who are both exploration companies and development companies, and we'll talk about the risk of that. There are also companies that are existing producers that are offering up big risks and big rewards by developing a new project. I'm, for the most part in this discussion, confining myself to a company whose primary business is development, which is to say they're not a producer or not a significant producer, and they're also post-exploration. Uh, so it could be that the discussion that we have today is a component of a larger discussion where you have to understand the exploration process if that's ongoing in a different part of the company, or you have to understand the net present value of their production but we'll talk about the development component today. And we'll talk about it mostly from the point of view of a company that is a single asset company, which is, we hope, proceeding to production. Okay, and what kind of market cap do these companies usually fall under, fall within? Uh, they're the larger of the juniors. So I think in most cases, uh, in the earlier stages, which is say, to say the preliminary economic assessment stage, you could have market caps as low as $70 million US. It's very common for uh, developers, however, of world scale deposits uh, with big capital expenses in front of them, uh, having market capitalizations of a billion or a billion and a half dollars. So okay. there's, a, there's a pretty broad range here. I mean, small caps to be sure, micro caps sometimes. Okay. Okay, well, let's take it away then. We got a lot to get so, under, get get away with. So, to begin the discussion, and I want to use uh, North American terms, which is to say terms that are familiar to investors in U.S. and Canadian equity markets, particularly Canadian equity markets. There are three documents which every investor should familiarize 
him or herself with. They are in ascending order of certainty. The preliminary ec economic assessment, the pre-feasibility pre study, and the feasibility study. The preliminary economic assessment is precisely what it states itself to be. It is a study, uh, preferably, <laughs> strongly preferably, done by a third party. That is to say, an outside engineering firm looks at a deposit, tries to quantify the reserves and resources, and does a preliminary study where they're using preliminary costings for the capital budget, preliminary costings for the operating expense, trying to forecast as best they can, which is not usually very good, what things like labor and energy costs will, will be. In other words, just trying to give you the economic spoke, uh, sort of framework to uh, understand a deposit. This is a very useful document uh, because it really gives you a target size uh, and it gives you a target size with a lot more information assembled than you generally would be able to assemble yourself from reading annual reports, quarterly reports, and press releases over five years. Somebody has done the work for you. It's up to you to look at the preliminary economic assessment, this first document, and question the assumptions that go into it. Very often, as an example, I will see preliminary economic assessments that use a mineral price substantially higher than the current market for the mineral. That's okay if you happen to believe uh, in that price. Uh, I also see preliminary economic assessments that talk about a deposit that's going to be built five years from now, and they use capital expenses as of today without factoring in inflation in the supply chain, which, by the way, is running substantially higher than inflation overall. So it's important to understand that what this preliminary economic assessment is, is really a summary of the project. It's to give you a very big picture sense of what can go right, what can go wrong, and over what period of time. I love preliminary economic assessments because they generally involve a thousand or two out, 2,000 hours worth of labor, which I didn't have to do. <laughs> and I have the ability of determining for myself whether I think the scope around the reserve and resource is accurate, whether the grade that they talk about makes sense, whether the infrastructure that they claim to have access to exists, whether the capital budgets that they have forecast are reasonable in the time frame that they're going to pursue them. All these things to tell me whether I think there is a reasonable chance, even a possibility as opposed to a probability, that this deposit will proceed into production. And it gives me too the ability to forecast, however inaccurately, how much time will elapse before this has occurred? And what, in my mind, are the critical risks uh, and critical goalposts, critical near-term achievements that I can use to monitor the success? Moving on from the pre preliminary economic assessment, we have a document commonly referred to as a pre-feasibility uh, study. The pre-feasibility study generally addresses the questions that were brought up in the preliminary economic assessment and attempts in every category addressed by the preliminary economic assessment to bring new updated da uh, data to bear. As an example, the company might have a lot of its uh, resource base in, inferred or indicated. And in a, in a pre feasibility study, enough additional drilling may have been done so that the inferred and the indicated resources become measured, uh, which is to say that they've been drilled off in a pattern that's consistent enough that people believe that they have an increasing understanding of the ore body. So the preliminary feasibility study updates the preliminary economic assessment, uh, gathers much more data, and identifies the data that is necessary for the company to say that they know enough about the deposit to actually go ahead with a feasibility study and build the deposit. The feasibility study uh, really is a document that goes back 40 years ago, where that was the document that was necessary to show to the chartered banks to raise the money 
the debt part of the money to begin construction on a mine. Uh, the feasibility study is, you know, really the sort of be all and end all study, uh, which talks about, as it suggests, the feasibility of building this mine and taking it into production. The important thing with regard, well, a couple important things. Occasionally, in a market where capital is very cheap, uh, which is to say a dumb market, a bull market, companies will successfully raise enough money with a pre-feasibility study to build a mine before a feasibility study. This usually ends in tears. <laughs> I've, I've probably seen 30 mines in my life that were build, built off insufficient documentation. And I'd suggest that three or four of them out of 30 have worked. If you see a proposal that suggests that a mine should be built without, uh, without completing the feasibility study, Although it's tempting to skip that time and skip the expense, don't. Just don't. Go on strike. With regards to the feasibility study, I have really two comments. The first is don't pay too much attention to pre net present value of pre-tax cash flows because you aren't going to see the pre-tax cash. <laughs> Go to the column to the right, which is the after-tax cash flow. That's what matters. You know how much money roughly you're going to put in, but you don't know how much money you're going to take out until you see the after-tax number. Uh, the pre-tax number isn't worth much unless you have tax loss carry forwards that you can add back to that column. It's the after-tax that matters. And then there's the whole range of assumptions. Albert, you're uh, an engineer, so you understand the necessity of assumptions in studies like this. Is the commodity price realistic? Are the energy prices realistic? Uh, are the operating costs realistic? Uh, many of these feasibility studies that I have seen have been really wanting with regards to the assumptions, which is to say the assumptions that went into it were so rosy that you could make anything work on paper. I once had uh, a reserves report in the oil and gas business, which is sort of the equivalent of a feasibility study, but it's actually better because the thing's already built. I once had a reserve study where the independent engineers actually miscounted the number of wells. A very, very, very fundamental mistake. So it's important once you get this feasibility study that you don't take it at face value, that you pull it apart. And I'm not trying to say pull it apart in minutia, you know? Um, I, I'm not saying that. Look for broad discrepancies. If the company has done a feasibility study around a gold project to $2,000 an ounce, and we're in a $1,650 world, ask the company, if you can, to get the model to run it at $1,650, or ask them if somebody else has run it at $1,650. It makes no sense to do a net present value calculation on a deposit uh, at a commodity price that's 15 or 20% higher than the actual commodity price. Uh, similarly, I've seen feasibility studies that had power costs that were approximately half the power costs that were prevalent in the mining area in the district. So these assumptions are fairly easy to understand. There are three numbers that I want people to pay attention to when they're looking at uh, PEAs, PFSs, and feasibilities. The first is simply the in situ recoverable value of reserves and reports uh, of resources. In other words, do you care? Uh, a small mine has all the risks attached to it that a big mine has, but a big mine can make you big money. A small mine can only make you small money. For myself, I want in situ recoverable reserves, however well-defined at the preliminary basis, the pre-basis or the feasibility study basis. I personally want the net present value of in situ recoverable reserves to exceed $2 billion. I'm not interested in small mines. I just don't want to know about small mines. I too uh, prefer deposits with decent grades. There are some very large deposits which make a lot of money at lower grades, but always remember the truism. Grade pays, tons cost. Large, low-grade deposits are okay for what they are, but understand the risks uh, associated with the trade-off between tons and grade. But the other, two, the other two numbers are really important. Internal rates of return. 
uh, I want a mine that projects itself to be in the best quartile worldwide in terms of return on capital employed. So you can either look at the number as an internal rate of return or as a return on capital employed. They will often, by they I mean the issuer, try and get you into something called return on invested capital, which means that you are looking at leveraged returns after the bank debt. Uh, these are unequal equations. <laughs> the leveraged return is not the same as return on capital employed or internal rate of return. I am un uninterested in a project personally that doesn't have an IRR, an internal rate of return, that's north of 25%. Uh, I think before you build something that the margin of safety that's necessary to invest in a development company is a 25% or better IRR. I also care about payback periods, although I'm less fussy about that than other people. Somebody who is building a very large deposit, which will produce for 40 or 50 years, may necessitate because of the gargantuan capital costs, a five or six year payout, where a mine with a 10 year life uh, might have a two or two and a half year payout. I, like everybody else, prefers the certainty of a short term payout, but I understand that sometimes the size of the prize discounts payout. But the another important number that I look at is something called all in sustaining capital. This is really the total cost at the operational site of the mine to determine whether this mine is profitable or not. I want my mines to be in the best cost quartile worldwide in terms of all in sustaining costs. Now, it's important that people who invest in development mines for leverage to the gold price or leverage to the commodity price might prefer a higher AISC company. If you have higher costs relative to your revenue, increases in the price of the commodity impact you positively disproportionately. For me, I'm much less interested in commodity price performance than I am the operating performance of the mine, which is to say I'm old enough, Albert, that if you take away most of my downside, you can take away some of my upside too, and I'm okay with that. So you want all in sustaining costs that are low enough that they give you competitive advantages over most other competitors that you would have, while at the same time allowing you to produce the mine through bad times when your other competitors might have to shut down. All in sustaining capital costs in US dollars in a gold deposit, a uh, thousand is a good number, 1100 is an okay number, 800 is a superb number, Think about making gold for eighteen for eight hundred dollars an ounce and selling it for sixteen hundred and fifty dollars an ounce. Fifty percent operating margins, <clears throat> pretty good business. So those are the numbers that I I think are really 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 important to understand in the context of each of the preliminary economic assessment, the pre feasibility study, and the feasibility study. Rick, uh, can I ask you a few questions at this point? Um, Please, absolutely. Clearly, those studies are a very important part of the development process and also your assessment as an investor. Uh, there's, in a way, they're gateways to capital. And so it brings to mind sort of the relationship between issuers and the ratings agencies. Uh, are there conflicts of interest inherent uh, in these things? Are there go uh, ex industry accepted standards for what these reports look like? Are there sort of um, a handful of trusted firms that do these studies that, that the sort of offer the, the quote gold standard or whatever in these studies that you should be looking for? Can you address those? No, no, and maybe. Uh, there is no accepted industry standard, uh, either from the industry or from the regulators, at each level of PEA, PFS, and FS, feasibility study. Uh, there is an informal regulator in the feasibility study, which is to say, will the market finance them? <laughs> I was going to say, is it mostly the, lend the lenders that pay yeah. for these, unlike the bond? Okay. No, it's not the lenders that pay for them. It's the issuer that pays for them. So why is there uh, not a conflict of interest then there, just like with the oh, bond there agencies? Is, there, okay. is, there is definitely, definitely a conflict of interest. We'll get to that. Okay. Uh, it is not unheard of. Uh, in fact, it's, it used to be common in the mining industry that the engineering firm that would get the construction con contract, the people who would become the engineers, uh, 
and the uh, EPCM uh, contractors would also do the feasibility study. <laughs> so they obviously had an interest in producing a document which would cause enough money to be raised that they could build the mine and get paid for it. Uh, this was commonplace. I To say that I prefer differentiating between the prime contractor and the engineering firm that did the feasibility study is an understatement. Uh, I, uh, in my naive youth, didn't used to insist on that, but those days uh, are done. With regards to rating agencies, Albert, most of the securities that I deal in, the development stage companies, aren't don't have access to investment grade credit. So you're not going to see the Moody's of the world, the Standard & Poor's of the world, uh, rating uh, a $300 million debt instrument uh, you know, for an upcoming junior miner. These things are in almost every case unrated. So you don't look too much for conflicts uh, with the regulators. What you do look for conf conflicts on is the reports that come from the brokerage firms where they're commenting on feasibility studies. The brokerage firms get paid for underwriting fees. And if the study isn't bullish enough that they can justify raising money, <laughs> they don't get paid. And so I, I found that the interpretation from mining industry brokerage firms of each of PEAs, PFSs, and feasibility studies are in general much too bullish for my liking. And, and that's a fairly obvious conflict. Right. Too, and, too often brokerage industry research is really sales and drag. Sure. I, and my reference to the uh, to the ratings agency was sort of analogous, Rick. Is, is there an incentive to get these studies from people who will give you kind of an easier time? Yes. Yes. And even even in the absence of adverse incentives, many first time issuers don't understand that if you go to the biggest and best engineering firm in the world, you also need to hire the best people in those firms. The intelligent mind builder doesn't just go to SRK or doesn't just go to Amec. They go there and they say, I want this person, this person, this person, and this person, because they understand the task at hand. Uh, I, that's another mistake I have made, uh, assuming that all of the people in all of the firms uh, deserve to wear or uh, have the business card of the great firm that they represent. Very often, you pay A prices for C plus talent, and it's something so that your own expertise is required to guard against. So true. You look at any industry, Rick, and especially your own, which you know a lot about, you look at it and it makes you think twice when you go in for that surgery, which doctor <laughs> you're getting, because there is a spectrum and Pareto's law is in effect. Um, <laughs> Rick, you know, Wally, these... Wally Shira, the astronaut, once said, you know, it uh, gives you pause when you're hurtling around space to understand that the assembly and every component was manufactured by the lowest bidder. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, or if it's a government contract, not necessarily. Um, right. <laughs> uh, but that doesn't, spell, that doesn't uh, point to competence either. Um, right. Rick, are these studies very expensive? And is that yeah. where a lot of the capital goes to? You talk about, what did you say, 70 million lower bound on capital for a developer? How much of the capital is needed just to actually to get through these studies? These are expensive. They take, take a lot of time too. So the company needs to maintain general and administrative expense and the supporting expense. At every level for each of these studies, there are, if you will, subcontractors, uh, people who provide the documentation which is a necessary component of the whole, but isn't the whole. So it is very common for preliminary economic assessments, the earliest stage document, to consume $3 million. It's not uncommon to see it consume $5 million. The preliminary feasibility study, likely the same, $5 million. The feasibility studies very commonly consume 10 to $15 million. They can done, be done for less on uh, simple projects or in projects where the initial report was unusually detailed. But these reports are exhaustive uh, and require an awful lot of money. The time frames 
that are accomplished in achieving each of these are also substantial. So when one is investing in a preliminary economic assessment stage company, understanding that the publication of the pre-feasibility study will increase the certainty around the deposit and therefore could, if the study is positive, increase the share capitalization, uh, pardon me, the uh, market capitalization, the share price, you need to understand that it might take you two and a half years to get there. And in addition for the $5 million it might take for the PFS, the company has to spend sufficient general administrative expense to last you the two and a half years it takes to get there. Remember, Albert, that we said in an earlier session that the way that you add value in developing companies, be they technology or anything else, is answering a series of unanswered questions. Uh, at each of these, you are actually framing the unanswered question. You're putting in place the nature, the ecosystem of the questions that need to be answered and the processes by which you answer them. Okay. Um... So is it possible or is it common that an initial study will re reveal some huge, basically, obstacle that's going to require a lot of capital that uh, is going to render the project just um, uneconomical and not worth pursuing any... Common. Yeah. Common. Uh, often uh, that results in a study that doesn't get published. <laughs> The company issues uh, a, a press release about the fact that studies are ongoing. Okay. Well, they frantically scramble around for another cust for another property that will keep their salaries being paid. Got it. Okay. But it's very common for the level of rigor that's required for each of these studies to document inherent fatal flaws that might not have been identified to the market until this, this work is done. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, Let's move on then, the, the next area. Well, <clears throat> we touched on it a little bit. Uh, and, and this is an intangible, but it's proven to be really important in my life, which is to say specific expertise. Uh, development stage company, and by the way, the independents who are producing the PEA, the PFS, and the FS, need to have specific expertise. Hundreds of times in my career, Albert, I have been introduced to people where the introducer said, you know, this person has uh, a proven track record of success in mining, which is great. But the expertise isn't necessarily um, relevant to the task at hand. And I've used this exact example before. Someone whose success involved uh, managing and operating, producing gold mine in two billion year old rock in the Canadian Shield in French speaking Quebec and could demonstrate success operating politically or with political, you know, with labor markets in Quebec, a legitimate success. But this person now uh, is involved in exploring rather than producing for copper gold porphyries in 15 million year old young rock in Spanish speaking Peru. While they have been a success, the expertise that resulted in that success is not necessarily translatable to the task at hand. There are groups in the mining business who I know well and have done a lot of money with, who while they are not themselves conversant in every form of specific expertise, have proven to me that they can identify the task at hand and hire resumes that are appropriate to the task at hand. Lucas Lundin and his father, Adolf Lundin, come to mind. They operated different deposit types in different, uh, different stages of development in different parts of the world because their expertise was identifying the needs uh, and hiring and incenting and managing uh, the human resources whose talents were specific to the task at hand. But most mortals, myself included, aren't capable of doing that. When a company is involved, let's say, in uh, finishing off the documentation for a feasibility study for uh, an open cast gold mine, part oxides, part sulfides, in arid terrain in the Western US, 
that's a very specific task. And it requires for the probabilistic uh, uh, successful completion uh, of the project, it, given optimal economics, it uh, requires geologists who have <clears throat> an intimate familiarity with that type of deposit. It requires engineers who have built that type of deposit. It requires political and sociological um, personnel who are used to the challenges associated with federal, state, and local governments in the Western states of the United States. The point is that you need to do a, a human resources uh, evaluation the same way that you need to do a physical resources evaluation. I have seen in my life uh, a lot of good deposits that got screwed up by bad people. Albert, you might recall when we were both still at Sprott, we did a reasonably exhaustive study of a little Australian explorer called Emerald Resources. And my, my willingness to invest in Emerald Resources, given that they were building a deposit in Cambodia where nobody I knew had ever built a deposit, had to do with the fact that I had watched these same guys build seven prior deposits. And what I knew was that while they didn't necessarily have uh, access to expertise that was Cambodia specific, they had a lot of experience around geological environments and climactic environments, which were similar uh, to the task at hand. Uh, fast forward three years, these guys brought into mine on time, on budget, in a country that doesn't have any formal mining uh, experience uh, in uh, a location that was 110 kilometers away from reasonable infrastructure. But because I'd watched these guys do it 30 times before, I knew that I either had specific expertise or I had access to expertise that was specific. Also, when I watched the progression of Emerald, and by the way, this is not a buy recommendation for Emerald. What I'm talking about in the course of this is the uh, educational aspect of the investment. When I looked at the preliminary economic assessment, uh, it was reasonable. It was rational. There were a lot of places in the preliminary economic assessment that said more work needs to be done on. <laughs> you know, I, I, it, it was just it was an honest document. The progression from the preliminary economic assessment to the pre-feasibility study uh, was polite in that the pre-feasibility study answered the questions that were brought up in the preliminary economic assessment. And the feasibility study too, at the end of it, the assumptions were reasonable. Uh, there was plenty of room. Uh, you know, the IRR was attractive. The all-in sustaining costs were attractive. More importantly, the assumptions uh, and the discussion of risks uh, were all well within the realm of believability. <clears throat> you know, I only had one question and you sort of answered it with this example, but the question was going to be, are there um, instances when you find it okay, you allow yourself to break that rule uh, because people like Ross Beatty don't show up one day uh, completed product. Uh, Ross Beatty was a new unknown at one point as well. And I just had a discussion with Brent Cook about this, about um, taking chance on lesser known or teams with lesser experience. What is your general approach to that? Um, if somebody who I know really knows them, uh, I might participate, but I'm unlikely to give them full allocation uh, until I know them better. Ross Beatty, I've known since he was in grad school. Uh, and if the audience looks at me, they'll know that was a very long time. Uh, and, and I know that Ross Beatty is one of those talent aggregators. Uh, Ross Beatty can hire people who have exp exp uh, access to the expertise which he might not have himself. And I trust Ross over time to get things done. I've been involved with Ross now in 14 companies, 13 of which have been hugely successful and one uh, well, no, it wasn't marginally successful. It was unsuccessful. But suffice to say, 13 out of 14 in a, a variety of different challenges uh, is a pretty good track record. Now, that isn't to say that any of them 
any of them have been easy. None of them have been easy. When I look back at my 10 baggers with Ross Beatty, the common factor is that they took five or six years to give me 10 bagger status. Uh, and I think every one of them experienced 50% price declines during the five years that I held them. So one needs to be uh, patient and persistent, which is a different word. But you can do that, Robert, if you've uh, established, uh, Albert, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was moving on to Robert Friedland somehow. Uh, you can do that if you have uh, enough experience with the management team that you know that they're asking themselves the same questions that you're asking them with better expertise. Rick, we have to we have to go now. I think it's uh, we're running out of time, but um, we're going to continue this topic uh, probably for one or two more sessions. I think because there's so much to cover. Your last. Uh, <laughs> Your last comment about suffering 50% declines in uh, these Ross Beatty projects, Ricks. If you believe in multiverse theory, there is a Rick rule who's getting 20 baggers on all of those investments. <laughs> yeah, I keep hearing this, but you know, uh, a, a noted financial commentator, Ben Baruch, Bernard Baruch, I'm sorry, uh, once said that the only guy who absolutely bought stocks at the bottom and sold at the top was a liar. It didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> And certainly looking at my own experience, uh, Albert, well, I'm not a deliberate liar. I sometimes make mistakes, but I didn't buy at the bottom and I didn't sell at the top. <laughs> right. <laughs> I try to take a fat slug out of the middle. Okay. All right, Rick, thank you very much. Uh, we'll see you back again next week. Always a pleasure, sir. Thank you. Thank you.